Okay, so uh, we're about to begin with our <coughs> second speaker, um, according to the agenda that I gave you before. So it's my pleasure to introduce Ben Cohen. Great, so um, I want to talk about single robot and multi robot path planning with quality guarantees. And so path planning is pretty easy, right? Nothing complicated. I will often use these game environments to demonstrate these various techniques simply because they're very visual. So in the upper left corner, we have a game character. That's the start location. We are given a goal location, and we want to find a path for the game character from the start location to the goal location. Now, one of the problems here is that the environment is continuous, so we need to discretize it somehow. So we'll discretize it into cells here. Um, and for every cell, we need to determine whether it's unblocked or whether it's blocked. So now we have a grid with blocked and unblocked cells. So we transform that into a grid graph. In this case, it's an eight neighbor grid graph that will change a little bit from time to time. So I put in the lower left corner what kind of grid graph we are talking about. And then we use a path planning algorithm to find the shortest path for the agent from the start vertex to the goal vertex. That's this path here. And there we go. And off the agent goes on its merry way. The path looks a little bit odd here. We need to address this. Already a problem on slide five. But we will address this later. First, let's think about how do we, how do we find short paths? Right, and so, so this one is all about heuristic search algorithms, so the A star variety. So they use user-supplied heuristics, H values, to focus the search, and these H values approximate the goal distances. Now, we want the H values to be consistent, meaning that they should satisfy the triangle inequality, um, and that implies that they're also admissible, meaning that they don't overestimate the goal distances. Now notice that on this slide here, I don't even define what consistent is because it's not really that important for the tutorial. You can just sort of wrongly think about um, that they don't overestimate the goal distances. But then the slide set that you have available has a ton of extra slides that spells it all out in detail and is completely correct, right? So use that as a resource. Okay, so how does A star really work, right? How does it use these, these H values? So let's look at what it does for this particular path planning problem here. Now we are talking about a four neighbor um, grid graph. So we want to find the, the red path in short. Okay, so um, let's look at the various uh, parts here. So ESDA maintains a priority queue. Uh, so that's called the open list. And in the priority queue, it puts the states that it wants to work on, that it wants to expand. Initially, that's just the start state. assign a priority to it, and what ESTAR likes is small f values. What's an f value? It's just the estimated distance from the start state to the goal state via the state in question. Okay, so how do we calculate the priority here? And that just has two parts, right? So we need to calculate the estimated distance from the start via the state to the goal. So first part is length of the shortest known path from the start to the state. Okay, so that's what we call the G value. And for the start state, it's zero because the length of shortest known path from the start to the state, which is also the start, is zero. And then the second part is the estimated length of the shortest path from the state to the goal. But these are just the H values, right? So we were given H values, we just supplied them, and for our state, that's a two. So for any goal R, then this F value is just the priority. We like no priority particular case. So what ESTA now does is, it always does the same thing. Right? It puts the state out of the, the open list with the smallest f value. It deletes it from the open list, so the blue is gone now, and then it expands it. And expansion just means it looks at all the neighbors of the state. Let's look at the neighbors in the north. We really, really like this point. It's a point, it's a jump. Okay? That's the neighbors in the north here. Um, and it asks itself the question, can I decrease the G value of that particular state? Now remember what a G value was, right? Length of shortest known path from the start to that particular state. Initially, we don't know any path, right? So the G value is currently not required. The default is infinity. So now the question is, can we decrease it by going from the start via the shortest known path to the state that we're expanding, the start state, and then we just go up one move um, to the neighbor. So G value, right, is uh, shortest known path from the start state to the state that we're expanding. The length of this is the distance. Okay, let's exercise 
factors, right? Um, and then one move more to reach the neighbor for total of one, right? So I can change the g value of the neighbor from infinity to one, right? And that's what we are doing here. And whenever we can decrease the g value, A star does three different things. A, it updates the g value. B, it remembers the, the state on the shortest path, on the shortest known path from the start state to the neighbor. And so, so that's what we do with the two terms. So, so now the shortest known path goes from the start to the state that I look to, which is the start, and from there up to the neighbor. And we put the state into the open list so that you can work on it some more. But ESTA doesn't just do it for this particular neighbor, right? It does it for all of the neighbors. And that ends the expansion of that particular state. And then ESTA just keeps repeating it and repeating it. So, so let me sort of skip through that until it is about to expand the most. Once it expands this one, that it has the lowest echo without the state in the openness, it stops. Now, let's look at this, right? All of the parent pointers over there, they form a tree. And here's the tree, right? That's called the ESTA search tree. And the tree is rooted in the start state. And so what we can do is we can trace that tree pointer on the move that's about to expand the go state to the start state. And that gives me a path from the start state in the reverse that is the output stand. The heuristics are consistent. It'll be a shortest path. Now, that's the path here. And we're done. So in this particular case, right, when you were about to expand the seventh state. But what if you had used different h values? Okay. So what you have just seen is these heuristics resulted in these states being expanded. You have copied that from the previous talk. But what if you had used the zero h values? Okay, in this case, A star would degenerate to right the value that corresponds to the start state, not to the goal state, and would have expanded all of these states to many more. can learn from this here is that um, ESR defines shortest path if you use it with a consistent heuristic. But the amount of work that it does depends on how, how large these reach targets are. Um, if you take a bad one, that's the amount of work. So just as an example, start the state to here, move the state to here, and only obstacle that sort of extends here, that creates the box extension. In gray, what you see is all of the times that A star expands, a lot of work. If you find larger but still consistent heuristic values, it looks like this, less work, A star writes fast. You want to find the highest consistent heuristics that you can. But what if you, you have picked the best ones that you can find in A star because it's such a large state space, still runs very really slowly. So what do you do then? So now you can play a trick and you make the H values even larger now I wish that I could really jump that high, but of course that's not planned. But I might be behind the some constant, right? Some, some weight larger than one. Now at that point in time, W times these consistent heuristics might no longer be consistent, okay? So you can't hope that ESA will find the shortest path, but it still gives you a quality guarantee. And the quality guarantee here simply is that the path that it finds will be at most a factor of W longer than the shortest path, right? And we call that a bounded suboptimal path because it's a constant factor guarantee um, that this weighted version, E star with a weight, provides to you. Right? And so, so in this case, right, E star does even less work. If you increase the weight, then the bound that, that, that you're given here right, becomes weaker, but you do even less work per bit. So, so far, so good, right? So, so now we know how to trade off in this particular case between the runtime of the algorithm and the length of the path that we find. And we often have to do this in large state spaces. But there's a problem. And I don't know whether you notice this, right? But if I, if I step back, right, in reverse here, um, in this part here in the box expansion, you see these things in the straight line distance as heuristic values. So you have a little minimum of the H value surface. And you notice that, that what happens is A star sort of expands, state expands, and it reaches this like amount of equilibrium in order to find your way out. And increase the weight, it still has to fill this. So if we have a lot of these local minima, large local minima, then you know the techniques that I just talked about, they don't really help a whole lot. 
What that means is we want to design a heuristic ideally so that it doesn't have these large local minima. But that can be really, really tough to do. Um, so what do you do about this? So here's an idea for you. You design some heuristics, and a friend of yours designs some heuristics. So now you have two sets of heuristics. Now you could run this time help, right? One version of Wendy Pixar on these heuristics, one version of Pixar on, on these heuristics. Is that a good idea? Well, you know, they probably don't have the local minima in the same places, so that's good, right? But they probably both have local minima, and because of that, this version of E star at some point in time needs to fill its local minima, and this version of E star at some point in time needs to fill its local minima. They'll both be pretty slow. Okay, so that doesn't help so much. But here's a trick that you can play. It's a, it's a nifty trick for multiple heuristic E star. So let's assume that you run weighted E star with just one heuristic, right? So you extend sort of the new sphere and now start to fill in this particular part, right? You extend the word part, there's more and more nodes. That's a nice trick that you can play in order to, to sort of trade off between local minima of different heuristics. Okay, so that basically concludes. That was a review. It was actually sort of a very dreading review for me because in a way, I mean, I assume that most people here have seen e star at some particular point in time. And I just wanted to make sure that we are all sort of, um, you know, have the same, same knowledge. So let me end this review here by just pointing out that you don't want to be afraid of using these kinds of search techniques. Um, here we use them for path planning, right, where state corresponds to location. But you can also use them in higher dimensional search spaces where a state might correspond to a location plus an orientation, maybe plus a velocity, right? So now the graph is embedded in a higher dimensional state space, so they will typically be much larger. But some of these techniques, like the multi-heuristic ASTAR, have been designed with that in mind. So, so don't let people who are interested in RRTs, for example, come in and say, well, in these higher dimensional state spaces, you have to use an RRT. So that goes back that there are different viewpoints on these algorithms, and you can get this to work, and it has advantages, because if you use E star type techniques, they're simple, they're general, and they provide these quality guarantees, and they're all pretty easy to achieve but they need to cope with the dimensionality of the state space, and that's where you put your engineering if you develop these kinds of heuristic search techniques. Okay, good. So, so that basically concludes the overview. Remember that on your slide set, you have a ton more slides that trace through some of these algorithms and so on. So if you wanna look at that, you get a much, much better picture, uh, review picture of, uh, of sort of the base knowledge that you would find probably in a textbook. Okay, so now what I want to do in, in the remainder of, of my time, I want to talk about both single robot path planning and multi-robot path planning. So we'll start with single robot path planning. And if you think about it, what matters in a search algorithm, right? There are three things that matter. There's the memory consumption, there's the runtime, and the resulting path quality, in our case measured by the length of the path. Now memory can be a big problem. But in our case, you know, we typically run this on, on, on sort of grid maps, so, so memory is not the big issue. So I worry about here, about runtime and the quality that we achieve. So, so on robots, things need to, to run fast. So my question now is, how can we make these search algorithms run even faster? So let's look at this first. And so here, right, I mean, in a textbook, they will typically tell you search is an online process, right? I mean, someone gives you a search problem, a map, a start in a Google location, you run your A star based algorithm, and out pops a path. But in reality now, people view search more and more as a pre-processing driven um, type of, of algorithm, 
where you have a pre-processing phase in which you can compile information that then makes the search itself much, much faster. So to give you an example here, there's a grid-based path planning competition that Nathan Sturdivant has run now for several years. And the way it's run is, is as follows. Uh, he gives you a map. So you know the map and you can pre-process it. You can do whatever you like, obtain any information that you like, you store that information away. That concludes the offline phase. And then during the online phase, he gives you repeatedly a start and a goal location on that particular map and, as, and, and you need to find a path. And you get evaluated by how much memory you use, how fast you can find the path, and how long the path is. Right? And so the question here is, what kind of information do you want to store away in the offline phase to accelerate the search in the online phase? And the reason why he created it was not so much robotics, um, but games here. Because if you think about it, right, in a game, um, you develop terrain maps during the development phase of the game. And you can do any pre-processing that you like before you ship the game. And then you ship the game, you know, with this information that you've stored away so that do, while someone plays the game, you can find paths as quickly as possible. But of course, that applies to robots as well. You often have maps in the, available of the environment in which a robot moves, so you might as well um, use that to your advantage. So the question is, how can we take advantage of that? And there are two things that we can do. Um, so you can find more informed age values than the ones that you would usually use, like the straight line distances, for example. Or you can... Uh, come up with other information that requires you to change the ESTAR search to take it into account. So let's do the easy part first, where we want to find more informed age values. And I'll just give you two examples here, two quick examples. Uh, one are differential age values. So what is this? So, so what you do is you pick one location in the train, could be any location, you pick it, um, and you call it the pivot train. Now, if you want to calculate the heuristic of a location, like this location here, how would you do it? Now, notice that once you're given a goal here, th these things form a triangle. And if it is really a directed graph, then you know that the distance from S to the pivot here is less than or equal to the sum of the distances from S to the goal and from the goal to the pivot. It's just a triangle inequality, right? So, so I wrote this down here. Now, you bring this one here to the other side, and now look what you have. You have a difference here, and the age difference here is less than or equal to the distance from the location S to the goal. So the goal is S. So the distance here is an admissible estimate of the goal distance, and it turns out to be consistent. So we can use this one here as a heuristic. Now, if you want the heuristic to be as large as possible, okay, so when is this heuristic large? So, so this one needs to be large, and this one needs to be small. So that, for example, if you, if you choose the pivot in this region, or you know, on this line here in general. But you chose it in the pre-processing phase when you didn't know where the start and the goal would be. You just knew where the map was. Okay? So you can't choose a good pivot. So how do you get around that problem? Well, you choose several pivots, right, distributed around the whole terrain. So that, in this case, you have several pivots, now you choose the maximum of the distance. An admissible and a consistent heuristic. And it turns out that if the train is undirected, and there is a slide in the slide set for this, it remains this, except this one here becomes the absolute largest. That's one way of coming up for robot navigation with pretty good informed age values. Let's look at a different way of doing this. So, so here's sort of some environment here. That the robot needs to navigate in. The goal location is here. The current location of the robot is there. You want to find a, a good heuristic um, for this location. Remember, a heuristic is just an estimate on the goal distance. Now it turns out that right, this wall here is blocked, uh, this one is blocked, so the shortest path actually goes around this way. You want to find a good approximation. A trivial way of doing this would be to say I use the straight line distance. But that's not very good here. It's like quite uninformed. It's pretty short compared with the length of the shortest path. So here's something else that you can do in a pre-processing phase. You take the environment and you embed it, typically in a higher dimensional graph. Here I embed it the environment into the same dimension. So what it is is just a map. Every point in the environment here is matched to a point in the environment. 
you can do it. It's a distortion, since a metric into 2D of the same environment. But typically, you want to map it probably into 3D or 4D. Um, and now, in order to define um, the characteristics for, for this field, for this field here, right, what you do is you get the state into this environment here. You take the goal and map it into this environment here. And then you take the straight line distance from that environment. Right? And so, so what you did is you distorted the environment so that the straight line distances correspond more closely to the length of the shortest path in the original environment, right? So you can see here, in this case, you would get that as a characteristic, which is a, a much more informed, a much higher characteristic than the straight line distance here. So the question then is, well, how do you do it, right? How do I take an environment and embed it into higher dimensional state space? And there are different ways how you can do it. Uh, Semi-definite programming is one of them. Um, that is pretty slow, but there's pretty good results. Uh, there's fast map also a much faster type of technique. I'll not go into details here, but just be aware of, of the fact that you can do that, and that often results in pretty good heuristics. Okay, good. So, so now, what other kind of information could we extract from an environment in order to accelerate the search, right, other than good age values? And here I wanna talk about hierarchies. So, so here's a graph, and I wanna search this graph. Remember in the paper session case, I don't know what the start and where the goal will be, I just know how the environment will look like. Um, so I want to search this graph. So what I'm doing here is that I'll assign a priority to every vertex. Highest priority one, next highest priority two, and so on. And you do that, okay, so you use some, some kind of guidance to, to do it, but here they do it kind of arbitrarily. So the priorities here are these red values. And let me now rewrite the graph so that same graph. So good, that looks more like a, a hierarchy. And now, and this is why this technique has the name contraction hierarchies, I will contract the vertices in order of their priorities. What do I mean by contraction? I take the highest priority vertex of one, so I take this one again, so here's the one here, and I will remove it and the adjacent edges from the graph. Looks like this, look at the left one, right? so I just removed it. Now that might change some of the distances in the graph here. Right? So for example, if I look at the distance from here to here, there's now four, whereas before the removal of the vertex, it was two. I don't want the distances to change. So whenever the distances change, I add edges, shortcut edges, um, in order to maintain the distances. So in this case here, I need to add an edge between these two of length two. Now, none of the pairwise distances have changed. Okay, so let's contract the next one, two here. If I remove it and its adjacent edges, it looks like this. Have the distances changed from here to here? So let's see. So they could have changed, right, because from here to here is three, but fortunately from here to here is also three, so they haven't changed. So I can just remove them. I do not need to add shortcut edges. Okay, so after I've done this, let's contract number three. Again, I don't need to add shortcut edges. Distances don't change. I can delete four, no shortcut edges. I can delete five, no shortcut edges. I can delete six, no shortcut edges. And whenever I put in a shortcut edge, I also put it in here in this graph. So the one that's <coughs> with this edge here. So why did I do this, right? I mean, this is the original graph just with edges added. Well, that doesn't really help us. I mean, it's a, it's a graph that's now, now larger than it was before. But the reason why it helps us is because in the online case, when we are given the start vertex and the goal vertex, the shortest path between the start and the goal vertex has an interesting property, namely that it only goes up zero or more times and then goes down zero or more times. So it's an up-down path. So that's great because let's assume that I ask you to find the shortest path here from four to five. So remember? up zero more times and goes down zero more times is a candidate for shortest path, right? And I need to search that particular part of the graph, but only that particular part of the graph. And look at this, there's only one up down path. Guess what? I don't need to search at all. That has to be the short, shortest path. 
And so that allows me to find quality time very quickly. Now, in reality, it will not be always that easy. There might be a couple of them, and you need to search them, and how do you search them? So you start to show you that you do a forward search that only goes up. You start with a poor mix, you do a backward search that only goes up. Right? And, and then they meet somewhere, and that gives you all the up-down path. Right? That allows you very easily to identify the shortest up-down path. That's the one that you can, and it happens to be the shortest path in the original graph. So this is an extremely powerful technique. I'm not sure whether anybody in robotics has used it, uh, but it's the kind of technique that underlies things like uh, uh, Google Maps, right? Because they have large root networks that they need to search. You need to search them very, very quickly, uh, and these techniques do the job. So let's look at how this looks like. So, so there's sort of some, uh, some game that uh, you go here, and you build a construction hierarchy uh, on top of that, um, and then we find um, all of the up-down paths That's the amount of search effort that you have to do. So quite powerful. So there's a different technique um, that we can play called subgroup graphs. And it generalizes visibility graphs from continuous graphs. So all of you know visibility graphs, I assume. So the idea behind the visibility graph is you want to find the shortest path in a true dimension. So in some polygonal environment, so you put all of the vertices at the convex corners of the obstacle, and then you connect every pair of vertices if the straight line between them doesn't lead to an obstacle. So that's a visibility graph. And then when I give you a star and a pair vertex, like this one, you connect it to the visibility graph in exactly the same manner. And then you search the resulting graph. And the shortest path that you find from the star to the goal in the visibility graph is also the shortest path for a point dropout in the two-dimensional environment. Okay, so I'm sure that you have seen this before. Now the question is, okay, so that was the And it turns out it exists and is very, very similar. So here's how it works. This guy, um, from, so we trace the vertices again at the convex corners of the block itself. Uh, so here's the convex corner. I don't trace the vertices here in the center of the thing that I'm trying to find. I trace them, so I have to trace it here. Um, here's the next convex corner, I trace it here. 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 And then I connect. Um, any two vertices um, as long as uh, the shortest grid path between them on an empty grid neither passes through the block itself uh, nor through other vertices. So that then is called a subgroup graph and is the equivalent of a visibility graph. So if in the online phase now I give you a start and a go location like this, again I connect it um, to my subgroup graph. Now I find the shortest path on the subgroup graph and that will correspond to the shortest path on the grid graph. Why is that a win? It's a win because um, if you look at the blue graph here, it will be much shorter than if you look at the underlying grid graph, or much smaller. And therefore, you can search it much faster. So how does it look like in, in reality? Right? So here's one environment, and this shows you the subgroup graph. So it's pretty sparse. But here's something very interesting. Um, so I told you about these contraction hierarchies, right? And I showed you this particular slide, and I build a contraction hierarchy. What if instead of building the contraction hierarchy on top of the terrain, I first build a subgroup graph, and then on top of that, I build a contraction hierarchy? Right? Because, because after all, this is just a graph, so I can use contraction hierarchies to accelerate searching this graph. And here's how it looks like. So, so that's the very, very sparse. And then if you look at the corresponding search trees, again, even sparser than before, right? So the combination can be really, really powerful if you want to search grid graphs. Okay, good. So, so that gives you a little bit of a taste of, of pre-processing based search, right? The idea of pre-processing based search was that we used information acquired before the search, in this case during a pre-processing phase, to speed up the search. But if you prefer, if you perform a bunch of searches in a row, then you can also use information from the previous search to speed up the current search. Okay? So very similar idea, but no pre-processing phase, but we use the information that we gained from a previous search. So that leads us to incremental search. So let's look at this sort of a little bit. Um, here again, 
You need exactly the same thing also in robot if the robot doesn't do the train in advance. So how can we model this? So here's again our, our network. Here's our robot. Uh, here's the desired lubrication for the robot. The robot has sensors on board, of course, and in the vicinity you can see whether cells are easily traversable, unblocked, or, um, or whether they are obstructed, blocked. And so, so here you know that all of these cells here on the other hand, for the gray cells here, we do not know, right? They could be easily traversable, they could be blocked. At this point, we just don't know. And we want to find the path of our robot from here to here. So how, how do we do it? That could be hard, right? Because you're, you're missing complete knowledge of the situation. And planning with incomplete information is difficult. But the way you typically tackle this is by planning more than once. You replan. You make some assumptions. You plan under these assumptions. And the assumption that you want to make here, for example, is that all of the gray cells, the ones where you do not know whether they're obstructed or not, that they're easily traversable, so that they're white. Find a path under that assumption. So for example, here's a path. And then that would be the past, right, with all of the techniques we already learned because it's a deterministic search problem at this point. So now you move the robot along those paths. Here we go. And now the robot sees more about the environment. this blockage. Oh man, that's a problem, right? Because the robot can't follow this path any longer. So what does it do? And the idea is very simple. You replan. Okay, you made a wrong assumption. Let's plan again. You plan again. You've got a path from here to where the robot should be. You take into account what you know about the map, and you still make this assumption that all of these gray cells here are probably unblocked. So we find this path. We move the robot along it. There we go. So it sees another blockage, path doesn't work any longer, it replans, and so on, until it either gets to the goal or it notices that it can't get to the goal. Okay? Pretty, pretty straightforward technique called planning with a free space assumption has been repeatedly discovered and rediscovered and rediscovered in robotics. Okay? A very common sense type technique. Is it good? So now if, uh, uh, let's, let's see here. So what we see here is, is a robot here doesn't know the environment, it has a laser for Uh, it uses planning with a free space assumption. So how does the trajectory look like? So we could try this one. It's smart, but it didn't work. So now we try this one. That's smart, but it didn't work. And now it goes all the way around and this time. The trajectory looks fine. Okay? Um, that's what a human might do who does not know the environment in advance. How good is it? So now the theoreticians among us out and you can analyze it. It turns out that in a grid with n unblocked cells, the worst case number of movements is between this number and that number. So let's look at the other one. Okay? It's slightly super linear in the number of unblocked cells. So a little bit worse than if we used, for example, similarity to back tracking for the robot, but very gold record. Okay? It's a good technique. Now, the problem that we are facing is if you want to implement this on a robot, then you need to search repeatedly, right? You found the shortest path here, and then it was blocked, and you needed to find another one, and then it was blocked, and then you needed to find another one. Well, that's not a problem if you do it on small grids, like six by four. But if you do it on huge grids, it can take too long. You don't want to stop the robot, right? And saying, oh, I need to replan. You sit there for five seconds. It's a bad idea, okay? So we need to accelerate the search. experience that we obtained with that search to accelerate the time to simulate it. So the question is, how do we do it? And let me give you the intuition first. Here's the intuition. Okay? This is the first step. This is the search tree. Okay? Um, 
that this I built um, until its termination divorce. And now I do the robot implementation in two blocks of uh, two hubs. And so now I run the ESR again. And it will find a slightly different case, too, because the wires are slightly different. So it finds the event of the correction of the problem in the previous case, too. So it's slightly different. Now, instead of running the ESR again to find the left set of trees, what I can do is I can take the left set of trees and change it a bit of action. What that means is I go to undo some particular stuff here, and I have to build up a bit more stuff here. But if the two set of trees are very similar to each other, then I can use a comparison of building up the red set of trees from scratch. On the other hand, if the trees are very different from each other, that might be extra work. So how do I do this? And so here I want to give you sort of a little bit more detail instead of just seeing it at a high level. And I want to do it in the context of a different example. I will get back to the robot moving in an environment that it doesn't know. But for now, the robot moves the environment. And the robot also doesn't move. It's always a start here and it goes here. Okay? The simpler environment to understand what's going on here. So if you want to find a shortcut, cut, you use the three bit algorithm. Let's assume it's other stuff um, to find that particular path. Now I move three blocks. And I tell you again which three blocks I move. You know exactly the environment. So I move one block from here to here. That doesn't make any difference. Okay? The path to manage is pretty good. Um, one that I move from here to here doesn't make any difference either. But the last block that I move goes from here to here. This block that I have, I need to find a new path. And now I can utilize Dijkstra again in order to find a new shortest path like this one. And my question than running Dijkstra again. How can you do it than running Dijkstra again? What kind of technique would you use? ESR, okay. Uh, good, okay. Um, so, so how can we do it even faster than ESR? Okay, so let's, let's try to understand this. And in order to tell you how I do this, I put numbers into the stack. This is before I move the blocks. And these numbers will correspond to the start of the stack. Okay? That's what it does from the start to the start. And I assume here that diagonal moves cost of one, simply so that I don't have to write a square root of two. It works, of course, if it's square root of two. Uh, but it makes my lot, life easier. This is five, five, because I can do from one, two, three, four, five in this direction. Now, first thing I want to convince you of is that, that um, looking at all of these numbers, you have these numbers, that's equivalent to knowing a shortest path from the start to the goal. Why? Well, if you have all the numbers, start to the goal in reverse. Okay? So once you have the starting system, without a search, you can read off the shortest path. So what I will maintain here is not the path, but what I will maintain here is the start distances. Okay? Now, these are the start distances before I move the blocks. These are the start distances after I move the blocks. So in gray cells, all of the start distances that have changed. Now, if I want to find the shortest path here, I need to update all of the start distances that have changed. Okay? But it's not all of them. Okay? It's in this case maybe, maybe a third of them. So I want to be able to do this without having to touch the start distances that have not changed. So how do I do it? So, so before I do this, so let me categorize these first arguments. So initially, right, I, mean, I said you use Dijkstra. What does Dijkstra do? Right? It uses heuristic values that are all zeros. Right? These are the all zero heuristic values. And it always does a complete search. Now then we learned earlier, say, well, but if you always do a complete search, at least use more informed heuristic values, higher reach values. Okay? That focuses the search more than, than just looking for this problem here. Complete search, but now with more informed reach values. Which it means that we just learned about just said, well, you know, maybe you want to do it, you know, with an uninformed search, um, with all reach values zero, but only recalculate those start distances that have changed. Okay. So, so that gets me into this problem here. It was done first in the context of compiler construction, oddly enough, uh, with an algorithm with this unpronounceable name, dynamic SWFFFT. 
And then what you'll do is you want to put these two things together, right? The heuristic and the implementer. So let's look at um, how fast these things are. This is the second stretch after I've moved the guy. Okay? So here's the, the guy stretch. Right? It starts here, right? And then you've got a concentric circle goes out until it hits the, the blue tree. So all of these gray cells, again, are the cells who start the switches. I needed to cut them. So the more gray you see, the longer the run time of the argument. This is this side, right? So now you can see clearly what I had earlier by focusing the cell. Okay? Um, in fact, there's many fewer cells that you can hit the run of time. Now, this is the second stretch after I move the block, right? If I only update the start positions that are pink, I see this amount of change. And what's really interesting to see here is that uh, this also saves a lot, right, compared to the two GP guy stretch rate. This saves a lot. But they put the work in, in different parts of the environment, right? This one here puts the work in the parts of the environment where start positions have changed. These start put work in the part of the environment where you have to look at the cell because otherwise you can overload the cell with traps, which is required because the dead has to be of start distance in order to, to guarantee to be able to find the cell. Now, the heat stretch rate calculates the start distance. If these cells calculate this, and if this guy calculates then you do very little work. Right? And that's sort of how the argument doesn't exactly do that, but close enough, right? And that is my thinking time. Okay, so, so let me teach you sort of how it works because I think there's no good tutorial out there, so I can't just point you just to that. Um, so, so here we have a task and a problem. Um, I filled in a, a bunch of numbers already. These are the D values of correspond to the correct start of the PC. Right? We can all, I think, convince ourselves that this, this is P, for example, because I can reach it from the start here to the end. Now, if I had not given you a particular value, and you can pick one that I can use, and this is just some guy stretch, let me know the logistic of four. How could you have calculated this? Right? If it's a simple way of calculating it, you would say, well, you know, what's the start of the PC? If the car is passed from the start, to this cell has to go through one of the neighbors. So, so it's either from the start to here in three moves or from the start to here in five moves. I want to get as quickly as possible directly to this cell. So first I go from here to here in three moves and then one more to get here. So this value here, the start distance, per definition, is just the minimum of the start distances of the neighbors plus one. Everyone with me? Okay, pretty straightforward. Um, now, whenever a value like this one here is the of four, what it should be based on the neighbors, based on the neighbors, the calculated switch cell, I call it locally consistent. Okay. Or just consistent for purposes of this tutorial. Okay. So, so this is consistent. Um, and in fact, if, if all of these values here really correspond to the true start distances, they will all be consistent. And in fact, they are. Okay. Every value here is what it should be based on the neighbors. Now, let me, let me now block one of the cells. Okay, so I block this cell here. Now, are all of the cells still locally consistent? No. The only cells that might not be locally consistent have to border the blocked cell. Because they were locally consistent before, nothing changed in the neighborhood of this cell, so it has to be locally consistent. So it's either this one that is not locally consistent, or this one, or both. Let's check. This one here is a zero, and it should be not based on the neighbors simply because it's a star. It should be zero. Start always has start distance zero, so it is locally consistent. This one here is a two. Based on the neighbors, it should be three plus one. It should be a four. It is too small. Okay. So what we do is we take all of these locally inconsistent um, locations, and I put them into my O with some F value, just like A star does. So in this case, there's only one locally inconsistent cell, and it's in my open list. And now I do node expansions, almost like A star does, except that the rules are very slightly different. So what does A star do? It picks the nodes out of the open list with the smallest F value, so we pick C3. 
Now we check. It has to be locally inconsistent. It would not be in the open list otherwise. But in this case, the value is too small compared to what it should be because it is a key and it should be a port. So the rule is, whenever you, put, whenever you take something out of the open list and it's too small, set the value to infinity. Okay? So now you know half of the rules. Okay? So, so I will set this guy here to infinity. Now, when I set this guy here to infinity, that can change whether it or its neighbors are locally consistent. So let's check. This one locally consistent. It is infinity, but it should be four. Not locally consistent. It should remain in the open list. Okay, so I should expect it in the open list. What about this guy here? Uh, this one is a three. Based on the neighbors, it should be a five. So it's not locally consistent. It should also be in the open list. I put it also into the open list, right? And for all of the other cells, the status will not have changed. I don't need to look at them. Okay, good. That was it. Okay. Next extension. We look again at a locally open list with a small attack value. And in this particular case, it is uh, this guy here, this guy. So take it out of the open list. Check. It is a three, it should be a five. So we need to make it larger. Okay? So we set it to infinity. That's the rule that you already learned. And we set it to infinity. Now we need to check for, for it as well as its neighbors whether they should be in the open list or not, because their status could have changed. Now it is infinity, it should be five based on the neighbors, so it should be in there. This one here is infinity, that's good now, okay? It shouldn't be anything else because based on the neighbor, it should be infinity, we take this guy out of the open list. This guy here four should be a six, belongs in the open list, and the same thing for this guy. Okay, okay good, so, so let's take the next one. Um, in the open list, small attack value is this guy here. Okay, this one is a four, it should be a six. Okay, so uh, it's too small, and we need to set it according to the rules to infinity. I'll do this. Now let's check for itself and the neighbors whether they should be in the open list. This one should be infinity based on the neighbors. It should be a six belongs in there. This one is infinity based on the neighbors. It should be a five belongs in there. This one here is a five, but amazingly it should be a five based on that neighbor, so it should not go into the open list. And so you notice what happens here, right? We set this guy to infinity, basically by saying, don't trust my G value, right? Don't you justify your G value, your star system, by pointing to me, because I might be wrong, okay? So we set this to infinity. This propagated to this guy. This propagated to this guy. But this guy is pretty sure that its value is correct, because it didn't rely on that guy. It justified its five via this guy, okay? So, so the propagation of this infinity Okay, so we pick the next one. The next one is this four here. Um, it should be a six based on the neighbors, so we'll set it to infinity. We'll check which one of itself and the neighbors should be in the open list. Now we pick the next one, and the next one is this guy. Now, this guy here has value infinity. It should be six based on the neighbors, so it is too high. We need to make it lower, right? And so we need a rule for that. I haven't told you yet, but we will set it to the value that it should be based on the neighbor. Okay, so, so this one is infinity based on the neighbor, it should be a six, we replace it by a six. That's all of the rules that you need to know. And in this case, it also happens that we now expanded um, the goal stage. So we can stop here. And again, anyway, how we do a six, five, four, three, two, one, zero, will give us now a shortest path from the start to the goal in reverse. Right? And you notice what we did is we needed to sort of Starting with where the local inconsistency was, we needed to sort of look at some cells surrounding that and correct their G values, but we didn't look at everything. And so, for example, we never needed to look at, at any of these values over here. They were just not in question. So that gives you a very, very fast technique um, for doing a lot of similar searches, one after the other. And it's called lifelong planning A star. So that's a really helpful technique to know. But remember that all of these examples were artificial because originally we talked about this example, right? And then I said, ah, we go to this other example because it's easier to explain. So let me go back to this example. So how do we, how do we apply this lifelong planning a star to this one? Now notice that we maintain star distances, right, G values. When the robot moves, if we were doing the forward search here, right, so 
then this would be the start of the search. But with, in the robot mode, all of the searches just escape because they depend on the start state. So what I will do is I will search backwards instead. Okay? Because the goal does not move. So that's what I've done here. So I put down all of the start distances. Let's look at this one here. Right? Uh, two is, is the start of the search. I search backwards. So zero, right, and so on. And here's now the amazing thing. So now this technique is very, very fast because it just needs to fix the small number of start distances that have changed and then the search is done and can be reviewed. Okay, so, so that's a technique um, that has been used quite widely, uh, quite uh, widely. Um, the application of large intelligence start with this specific robot navigation scenario um, is called uh, D-star light in honor of an algorithm that came before it, D-star, that works according to similar principles but it's more complicated and has been very, very widely used on, on robots. Uh, so for example, I have nothing to do with this, right? I mean, this is actually done somewhere else. It has been done somewhere else. Um, but, uh, but it has been used um, by a collaboration of CMU and, and GPL on the Mars rover Spirit and Opportunity, uh, precisely so that the Mars rover But they actually reported and said, look, you know, on, on the Mars rover, we needed to resort to additional hacks to get the algorithm um, to be as fast as we needed it to be. Why? And that's because processors on, on Mars rovers need to be radiation hardened, and so they always lag behind in the technology curve in quite a bit. Now, of course, we want to don't, we are not on Mars here, right? We need to worry about this. We are on Earth. Uh, we can use faster processors. Every year, even faster processors come out, right? So, so are these techniques still important? And the answer is not in the way I told you. Because if you do path planning in 2D, the state space is typically pretty, pretty small. Meaning they can be searched rather quickly. Also, um, since we don't use the kinematic constraints of the robot into account, right, the path might have sort of changed its point of turn, which is not great, right? Because how the robot navigate its point of turn, but there will be some controller, right? The way you want to use these techniques on Earth is for motion planning. So in a higher dimension space space, where you also have orientation and velocity required. Right? Because now you can sort of think like, hey, a robot really, a car-like robot has a turn radius, but the turn radius depends on the speed of the robot. Now, the space space is now becoming much larger, it's also higher dimensional. At the same point in time, you can almost directly execute the plan because it takes already the kinematic constraints of the robot into account. So in other words, space planning Past planning execution, this is exactly when you need these kinds of techniques. Let me give you sort of one more application, um, and there are many more. Um, so, so a different way how you can use this technique is this. So let's assume in a robot, you need to find a path very quickly because you don't want the robot to sit there, right? You want it to move. So what can you do? Well, what we have learned is don't use these stars, use weighted these stars, right? And pretty high weight because typically that expands very few nodes It might find only a path whose length is 2.5 times longer than the shortest path. So you do this, right? So, so really you start expand sort of a, a bunch of, of states here and finds this path here, uh, length 11. And then you do an any time search, meaning that if you don't need the path yet, right, because the robot hasn't quite reached the, the, the space of the yet, so you still have a little bit of time, then you say, okay, now, now I can find a better path. And that hopefully will produce a better path. So maybe you set the weight down to 1.5. Right? Really, you start with two three weights per minute. And in this case, you're unlucky to find a path also of length 11. Okay? But you still have a little bit more time. So now you can set the weight even more or simply one, in which case you know you will find the shortest path. And you've got the algorithmic dependence, and it finds, finds a path 
you of ten movements. Okay, and then you can exit. So this feels like you have a path always at the end of the way that's needed. You don't even know exactly when you need it. But the problem, of course, is that you, you search here, and then you search here, and you search here. But that sounds familiar, right? Because you have a sequence of similar search points. Now, in this case, you know the environment, so it needs to be the exact same environment. You know the start and goal, so it's the exact same start and goal. What has changed here is just the route. You can apply these, these incremental search techniques to this situation here as well. And if you do, then you go down from uh, 50 node extensions here to one, and from 20 here to nine. So you, you really, really speed it up. Right? And so, so the combination of these techniques has, for example, been used by Tom Dumas um, on the entry to the uh, DARPA Urban Challenge. And that has been used as maneuvering. So either things like detour return or parking in a parking lot, right? All these difficult maneuvers. Okay, good. So let me mention that this particular technique that you learned about, family of techniques, I should say, uh, it's not the only one that exists. So I want to show you one other technique, um, and that's called adaptive e-star. It's a very simple technique. The idea is this, right? You search the first time on the search tree, and so now the second time you run an e-star search unchanged after the just move, but you update the heuristics in between. That sounds familiar. Okay, we already discussed, you know, how you can update heuristics. So I want to do exactly that. So how do we do it? And that turns out to be pretty straightforward. So let's look at, at this diagram here. Right? So we're going to find out um, the, the updated heuristics for, for this state here. And this was a state that was expanded by my first A star search. And so how do I update the heuristics? So what I know here, again, this is a triangle, that the distance from the start to the goal is less than or equal to the distance from the start to my state S plus the distance from S to the goal. So what we found here, now we can just subtract this term here, bring it to the other side, and now let's look at this difference here. This difference here is less than or equal to the distance from the state to the goal, to the goal distance. And remember that that line means that this one here is an admissible heuristic. It doesn't overestimate the goal distance. So I can use that as a heuristic. And it turns out it's also consistent. And I have all of these terms available because after the first search, the distance from the start to the goal is just the d value of the goal, and the distance from the start to s is just the d value of that. Okay? So for every expanded state, I can calculate new heuristic values just like this. So let me show that to you in action. So here again, we have the navigation problem. Robert here, it doesn't know the environment up front, but it sees lots of bits here and here. So it finds the shortest path from here to the goal location. It just, it just runs an A star search with different heuristic values. It moves along the path. It gets up to here. So now it wants to move here, but it sees that this thing is blocked. So it needs to plan a new shortest path. And let's assume that it runs an A star search. So it's just a regular A star search to the previous heuristic that gives me this. In gray, again, I see all of the expanded states. Now, if I update the heuristics in between, then what will happen is that I will update four heuristic values in each one. And now, if I do the A star search from here to here, it does not expand these two states compared to, to earlier, right? So even in a small example, you can actually win by doing these fewer state expansions. So that's basically the idea. And one of the interesting things is if you compare these two things, right? The first technique, like the same, have very complementary types of properties. Um, so according to what I told you, for example, is that uh, here the start mode needs to remain unchanged because it maintains start distances. Um, here the goal mode needs to remain unchanged because heuristics are with respect to the goal. Um, this can result in more node extensions than the new start. This can because the heuristic size will only get better and better. Um, so you know you can take your pick. No one has yet managed to fit these two things together. So it might be an interesting project to really think about this, um, how to obtain an even more potent heuristic search algorithm. 
Okay, good. So, so that gives you a little bit of an idea here in how we can utilize information from the previous search to speed up the current search, right? And that is important if you do a bunch of searches in a row, right? If you search a couple of similar things, right? Okay, but so far, everything that we were concerned with is just about making the search more and more efficient, right? Letting it run faster and faster. Now I also want to go a little bit about the quality of the search. And so, so in particular, right, so here uh, we are given a continuous environment. So I start here, go here, and I find the point R for a point robot. How can I do it? Well, you now know techniques to do it, right? I mean, it's no longer a big deal. Um, so what I'll do is I'll put down these two measures that are here in the interval, the run time and the length of the resulting transition. Technique one that you have learned is use a Pretty straightforward. Um, as we've learned, right, the visibility graph is actually still trying the shortest path in two dimensions. It's no longer true for three dimensions, right? But in two, it will find the shortest path. But the problem here is that once we have identified all of the, the vertices of the visibility graph, right, the convex corners of the start of the goal, you need to connect any pair of vertices, right? And so for that, you need to check whether the straight line between them goes through an obstacle or not. So you need to do a ton of checks because the number of, of pairs that you have to look at goes quadratically in the number of vertices. And every pair, right, I mean, for, for every check, that will also take some time because you need to sort of trace along the line and see whether an obstacle is on it. So there are sort of very sophisticated versions of visibility graphs. But on, on my spectrum here, typically they fall here, right? Optical path length, but computation time quite high. Okay, what else can we do? Well, you can do what we have always done, right? Right from the very beginning, when I gave you the motivating example, we can just discretize the environment and here sort of happily including the block eclipse, which corresponds to block cells. Okay, so that's good. Um, and then you can find the shortest path on the, on the resulting grid graph. Let me use an eight neighbor grid graph here. So now you run your A star search and you find the shortest path. But notice that it's not the shortest path in the continuous environment, right? Because the shortest path in the continuous environment would be here and then here. So we made a mistake. Why did we make a mistake? Well, the reason is that the edges of the path that A star returns will be grid edges. Right? And there are just no grid edges where they need to be to find the shortest path. So it's a problem, right? And that also resulted in a major example, in a motivating example, in this kink in the path. Okay, which is a bad thing, okay, don't do that. So the first question that we need to ask ourselves here is, so a grid path obviously is not necessarily the shortest path in a continuous environment. So the question is, well, how much can it be off? How much longer can it be? And you can analyze that, it turns out. So it depends on what is the dimensionality of the environment, is it 2D or 3D? It is how you tessellate or do you tessellate the space? Uh, do you tessellate it into triangles, where do you put the vertices? Do you put them at the corners of the cells or at the center of the cells? And then how many of the neighboring vertices do you connect the vertex to? Um, you know, it could be six or 12, um, depending on, on what you want to do. And so if you look at the most common case here, 2D square grid, vertices at corners, you connect to the eight neighbors. That's the case that I've used quite often, um, you have, then you can analyze that the shortest grid path can still be 8% longer than the overall shortest path. And if you go to higher dimensions like the 2D, and depending on how you do it, it can be 13% longer. Okay, so it can be quite a bit longer. Uh, so there should be room for improvement here. Okay? Don't return grid paths. How do we do it? So let's think about this sort of a little bit. Um, there are two things that come to mind right away. One thing that comes to mind is, well, use a higher connectivity. Right? So this is a four neighbor. So, so here we have four grid cells, two grid neighbors. Um, and so we put the vertices at the corners here. And so here we connect to four neighbors. Here we connect to eight neighbors. But you can get a higher connectivity as well. Right? Here we connect to 60 neighbors, for example, and then you can be 32 and so on. You lose some of the nice properties, right? Here all the angles are the same. 
You would think that this might be pretty, pretty slow because the branches had to increase a bit, quite a bit. But, but people have figured out how to combine some of these techniques with the techniques that I talked about earlier to make that actually quite fast. So it's something to consider. But you can also stay where you are in, in the evening like this here and say, well, you know, why don't I post optimize this task? Right? It's obviously not good, but, but let's look at the middle vertex, right, by directly going from the first to the third. If that shortcut is unlocked for trying inequality, let's do it, right? Um, so let's do it again. Oh, that's blocked, okay. So at this point we are done, we can uh, optimize it any further and you find this particular task and it's an optimal task, okay? So post-processing gets you a long way toward finding a good task and can also be done relatively fast. But often it does not give you shortest task or, or even close to shortest task. And here's the reason why. If you look at this grid here, uh, so we have um, our stars here and our zero here. And you want to find the shortest grid task on that grid. There are many shortest grid tasks on the grid. Okay? And which one you find really depends on how your search argument weight ties. So let's assume that, that our search argument found this task, the shortest grid task. The truly shortest task is this guy here. But it goes around the offsetting in a different way. So it's in a different homotopy class. And typically these post-processing methods, these optimization methods, don't change the homotopy class of one of the tasks. So, so in this case, if you try to apply the method to this one, nothing will happen, it can't be shortened. That's the result that you get. So that's a problem. We want to be even better. And what we want to do here is not do first the search and then optimize the task, but we want to interleave the search with the optimization. Why? Because the search then is based on better assumptions. Right? Rather than making all the wrong assumptions up front, finding a task that's not so good for post-optimization, if you interleave it, the search will see the result of the post-optimization. So let's do that. And that gives us sort of a variety of techniques that are called any inner search techniques. The idea is that, that the lines are here in this diagram to give you a good trade-off between computation time and toughness. I only want to talk about one of them here, um, this theta star, because very, very straightforward. So here's again our grid with the stars at the bottom. And what theta star is, is just an A star search. It's just one small event. So we do a regular A star search. We start, you know, with the star space. We expand it. We pick the next state, and um, we expand it. So the next state is this guy here. We expand it. Remember what an expansion is, right? We try to all of its neighbors to see whether we can lower the g value by going from the start via the state to the neighbor. Okay? So A star, for example, would look at this neighbor here and say, okay, so can we lower the g value by going from here to here and then down here? Right? And the answer here will be yes. So A star would say, great, I create a parent pointer of the search and find this guy here. So, so that I remember that this set is the predecessor. Now all we are doing is we are adding a second thing to it and we are saying, well, can I cut out this guy? Okay? So instead of just looking at, hey, here's the shortest task, shortest multiplier from the start to this guy, and then going to this, we are saying, can I cut this guy out? Take the shortest task from the start to the parent of this guy, okay, so that's the end of task here, and then go directly from here to this case here. Now, again, if the blue line here is unlocked for trying inequality, it's a good idea. In this case, it is unlocked, and so A star would set the parent of this guy to this guy, theta star would set the parent of this guy to that guy. Uh, let's look at another neighbor here. So theta here, for example, A star again um, will set the parent of this guy uh, to this guy. Theta star will try this, but it goes through an offsetter, so not a good idea. So theta star will do the same thing that A star does, and the parent will become this guy. So we keep expanding my vertices until we are about to expand the whole vertex. And then just like A star, we'll follow the parent pointer uh, from the goal vertex to the start vertex. And that gives me a path from the start to the goal in reverse and we will return that. Now in this case, um, we found the shortest task. So fine, it worked, but it's not guaranteed to work. So let me tell you why not. 
from the smallest example that I could come up with, um, where it doesn't do that, the two examples from here, and it turns out data size of finite smallest part to all of the data sets but this one. So, so it makes a mistake here when it assigns it to parent in the bit surface for that and it assigns the red part instead of finding this one. But the, the error here is, of course, very, very small. So in general, you find very, very good paths. Okay, so there's a variety of NNN search arguments out there. Uh, let me point out some of them. What I give you here is sort of a base search argument. It's very versatile. It's easy to understand. It's easy to implement and therefore also easy to extend. So if you have a need for using any NL search in a complicated context where you, where you can't just take it off the shelf but you need to think about how to extend it, data star is a good starting point. But it's by no means the fastest algorithm. There are several versions of data star. In particular, let me point out here data star on top result. Very simple idea. You just put together what you already learned. Um, you want to search an environment. What you learn is one fast way of doing this search the sub-result instead of the underlying result in a relatively long time. So if you want to speed up data star, what you can do is instead of running data star on the grid, you run data star on the sub-result. And that results in one of the fastest sub-optimized any other algorithms that currently exist. So here's how I'm going to look at the speed analysis. But it is suboptimized. Um, out of the, the other NNN search arguments, let me point out two of these stars here uh, for two reasons. A, it predated data star. B, uh, it has been used on Mars Rover, same team as before, um, because they put together uh, this B-star algorithm and uh, this NNN component into one algorithm. So now you have an incremental NNN, NNN algorithm. Okay? So so you can sort of mix and match some of the, the various techniques that you learn about here. Right. Let me also point out um, very recent optimal search algorithms. So they find the, the shortest path in a continuous environment, and they have become very, very fast. They don't beat the suboptimal ones, right? Uh, but if you look at the optimal ones, the best optimal ones, so this one here was the, the data science of the results. The optimal ones, if you really need to, to get speed and good quality, you can use them. They are quite hard though, so if you need to extend them, it'll take you sort of more brain power to try to figure out how to extend them. For example, it's very clear that you can extend them from 2D to 3D, but no one yet has done it because it is difficult to do. It right? might be a good, good project to then for one of you if you want to work on this. Okay, good. So, so let me point out um, that if you do want to use uh, standard motion planning techniques like RSS, for example, um, then even their algorithms like data star are really helpful um, because a typical um, RP is sort of plain vanilla one, right? I mean, that, that you've learned about samples sort of uniformly um, across the, uh, the search base. Um, and that's often a bad idea because you waste a lot of these samples. So one thing that you could do is you could run data star, uh, say for a real mobile rover, uh, from the start uh, to the goal. Now, the trajectory here will probably not be kinematically feasible, but the kinematically feasible optimal trajectory is probably pretty close to the theta star trajectory. So what you then do is, then you use an RFP which correlates around the conditions of the time here. And that seems to beat a, a lot of other motion planning algorithms that are out there. Okay, good. So, 
So that's what I wanted to tell you about single robot path planning. So now let's graduate and go to multi-robot path planning. So here, the problem is, is very simple. Again, we have a known environment. We have more than one robot. We know where they are in the environment, two robots here, and we know where they're supposed to go, like here. And what we want to do is we want to find collision-free paths for them so that they minimize some hidden objectives like mid -span, the latest arrival time of the robot at its goal location, or flow time, the sum of the arrival times of all robots at their goal locations. So how do we do it? Now, if we want to use the techniques that we just learned about, like ASTAR, we can plan for each robot independently. So here's how the robots do that. But now, unfortunately, the blue robot here has reached its goal location and will block the green robot. So that doesn't work, right? So we need to plan for them jointly. That's a little bit worrisome because the state space now contains all of the locations of the robots, so grows exponentially in the number of robots. But then we will figure out that the blue robot here needs to go into the alcove, let the green robot pass, right? That's the optimal solution. Okay, but that's only a problem um, that we need to plan in this, this large state space if you want to plan for many robots. Unfortunately, we do want to plan for many robots because the prototypical application here is feeder type robots uh, for the Amazon warehouse robots. Uh, so the way Amazon So to see how narrow they are, let's look at this one here. All of these are the so And that means that if one robot moves to the corridor in one direction, the other robot has to move to the corridor in the other direction, they can't pass each other. That makes it tough for the planning process because we need to find collision-free trajectories. So how do we do it? And so what we do is we model this again on the grid, like everything that we did. Um, so every robot can move north, east, south, and west into, into an adjacent unblocked cloud, but there are two things that are not allowed. Two robots trying to move into the same cell at the same time. They would collide in the cell, which is where the two converges, which is called the vertex collision. And what's also not allowed is two robots trying to change location in the same time space. So this one moves from here to here, this one moves from here to here. They would this is an edge collision. So we need to prevent vertex collisions and edge collisions from happening. Okay, so maybe there's a fast algorithm out there. We can just take it off the shelf. But unfortunately, it turns out that multi-agent path finding is empty hard to solve optimally for both make span and flow time minimization. So this is different now from single agent searches, right? That's polynomial time solving, fast, right? This is empty hard. Why is it empty hard? Uh, we use it for a long time because these are the, the 15 puzzles, right, that your AI teacher probably tournamented me with. And if you view every one of these tiles as a robot, right, and say, dear robot tile, move to your goal location, then you have a multi agent pathfinding problem. We know that solving the A puzzle optimally is empty hard. Now, as you know, uh, whenever you can't do things optimally, let's try to do things bounded suboptimally. Right? It still gives us quality guarantees. We are still a constant factor away from optimal. Right? So we want quality guarantees. Uh, so let's try to do this. But unfortunately, we have a Bluetooth theorem that says that multi agent path finding is empty hard to approximate, even within any factor less than 4 over 3 for make span minimization on grass in general. Now, notice that this has sort of some restrictions, right? It only is known for make span. It's not known for grids, but only for grass in general. But at least it is suggestive of the fact that it might be empty hard to find bounded suboptimal solutions as well. Okay, so NP hard or not, right, we need to solve this. How do we do it? So there's a search algorithm that solves it. Um, and there are several of them available. I'll give you the easiest one, it's also one of the best ones. 
Ähm, so, hier ist ein kombinativer Stoff, two large blue one, never gate from here to here, red one never gate from here to here. We stand for them independently. So that's fast. They minimize the expanded flow time. We are done. Okay. Unfortunately, here they do collide. Um, and there's no oxidation. Yeah, I mean, even this cell here is not an oxidant. Um, this just creates a collision point, which was a time step two that they did enter this cell with vertical collision field. Bad. So, what we need to do is we need to resolve that. How do we resolve that? Well, we know that two orbits cannot be at the same vertex at the same time. So all we can do is take a disjunctive from single space. We split this situation into two situations. In one situation, we do not allow the red region to be in this cell here at prime two. And in this situation here, we do not allow the blue region to be in the collision cell, this cell here at prime two. Okay? Now, the optimal solution is at least here or here, maybe in both cases. We will not prune the optimal solution because the only thing that we prune is something that leads to a collision which cannot be a solution. Okay, so now we need to, to work on this and this. So we will do a heuristic search, an A-style-like search. So we pick the one with the smallest F value. Let's assume it's this guy here. Now, we have a full cell constraint on the red region. So all the agents, again, plan independently, which is a constraint for this cell. The blue region doesn't need to be planned because whatever path it finds here, since it doesn't have a new constraint, right, is fine. The red region now needs to satisfy this constraint. It needs to find the shortest path from the cell to the goal, something in the blue region to the point there. But the A is constrained. And if you think about it, that we can be very convinced that the standard is just so. How we do it in a three dimensional environment, x, y, t, where the constraint just corresponds to a block cell. Okay? Pretty straightforward. So it finds again the short path from cell to goal that satisfies the constraint, this cell. Unfortunately, right? The lower space again collides, so we need to split this situation into two. Right? And then we do a heuristic search over this particular field. Now, what's important to remember here is that if you have a ton of collisions here, the root of the tree already all along forms or paths independently, that's bad because we need to resolve all of these collisions, and that takes a lot of work. We want to have as few collisions as possible here. So, in reality, the robots do not plan independently. What I do is I just order them, and in some order, it doesn't matter. I do, do order them to the robot, and then I plan for the first robot first, then I plan for the second robot, and it makes ties so that it avoids collisions with the first robot. Then I plan for the third robot, and it makes ties again so that it avoids collisions with the first two robots. Okay, everybody with me? So that results in, in a path for all of the robots, shortest path in the video, not taking the other robots into account, but hopefully in a couple fewer collisions that I don't need to resolve afterwards. So the search is pretty fast. Okay, so I want to reduce the number of collisions even more. How do I do it? And so sort of here's a cool technique that has been developed in the context of uh, single robot planning for manipulation planning, in fact. And it's a technique that gives you a path, um, but it uses edges in a given subgraph graph, you know, the, the technique called experience graphs, uh, as much as possible. So give me, give me a path, right? Reuse certain edges, or use it, certain edges as, as much as possible. So, so the idea here was, uh, you know, if you put a digit with this bottom, first digit of this put in, you get a certain trajectory out of it. The second trajectory for the second bit will have a slightly different start position because the bit is in a slightly different <coughs> position from the tree, and a slightly different goal position because you can't move it exactly where you move it to see this bit. Um, but then in between, you want to reuse as much as you can of the previous trajectory. Right? If you keep trying to find it, you might as well reuse it. So that was their idea. But we can utilize this one as well because we utilize it um, by, by enforcing lanes, traffic lanes. I will call them highway here, but I really mean sort of a highway lane, a direction of movement for the robots. And the idea here simply is that if the robots for the most part move in a lane, there cannot be front-to-front -front collisions of the robots. Right? I mean, it could be one, one robot could run into the other from, from behind, but they can't be front-to-front. -front. So that reduces the number of collisions in the root node that I have, and it speeds up conspicuous search. Okay, so how does it work? Uh, so then I look at this here, so there's one of these robots here, there's one of these here, and there's one of these here, there's one of these here. The robots Now we can see that, that, that there's still something 
robots coming in the opposite direction. Um, now, what's also cool is that I can make this algorithm here into a bounded subaltern algorithm. And this algorithm here is also a bounded subaltern algorithm. So if I put these two ideas together, I get a bounded suboptimal algorithm out of them, with quality guarantees. Yeah. Um, now, what happens if the user makes a mistake? against the direction, if necessary, to guarantee quality outcomes. Okay. So the humans can make mistakes, but these mistakes only affect efficiency of the algorithm, not solvability. Now, is it easy to come up with highways? And the answer is it's, it's quite straightforward to do that. So for example, here, uh, you would have one highway from left to right, next highway from right to left, and so on. All right. So, um, So how well does this work? Um, so here's sort of a small example. 130 meters, uh, how about the move from this area to this area, how about the move from this area to that area. So here we have two times how about the next two bounds two. Hundred days first for 50 seconds, hundred days first for five days, about half. Okay. So we can make a small thing. And then also tell you that um, the methods currently for reasonable size field spaces don't quite work in, in the two real time. So you want to use them right here to count, for example, in front of the checking station, not in the middle of the warehouse. But we can speed them up further. We are not done yet with our bag of tricks. Um, so um, remember that I said that in the root group, I order the robots. I understand tasks for them in order. And it turns out that sometimes uh, hundred days first to five days, they run very quickly. So you see, you run time. And it's very hard to predict which order of robots needs to fit position and which one takes forever. So now you can hedge your bet. If you have a run time, say, of five minutes, what you can do is you can now distribute the time. So if you run it for five minutes, then you know, out of 50 uh, different problems in physics, uh, you can solve 30 of them. Okay? 50 is essentially 70 tricks. And here's the tricky thing. You say, I run 100 days first. Not one time for five minutes, but five times for one minute. Now, if you really run it unchanged, right, it would have the same run time, right? But now what you do is you use a different priority for the robots in the root group. Some of them, then, then might terminate the task. Some of them increase the result. If one of the five runs terminates very fast, it becomes a minute to solve the problem. And that's what you usually might see. This is a standard trick um, a rapid random heat charge that is used with combinatorial optimization in general. And this is just a specific combinatorial optimization problem. Now, let me talk about some generalizations here as well. I hope it's quite, I, I lied a little bit to you when I said, well, here's what you might think tough time problem is all about. Right? I said, you have a bunch of robots, you know where they are in the environment. Uh, so which one will you do? Right? And then you said, okay, the problem is actually hard to solve. Even to approximate, um, but you know we can solve it halfway decently efficiently uh, with E-star approaches like this one here. But this is just a very of my view. <laughs> and it is where you have a given number of robots who have the same number of of zero G spaces for the robots, but you account for one to one mapping from the robots in your direction, and then construct these tasks for the robots so that you minimize the now you have more work to do, but you need to assign these only cases to the robots. However, and here's a way to turn out that you can do this with any number of parameters, with very fast, if you do it right. Um, why can you do this? And in a way, you have more wiggle room, right? Because you have more things under your control, and that you can use as well. So how do you solve? Well, you solve it typically with three basic cases, like the Maxfield algorithm. Let me show you how this works. Um, 
So yes, there are violence. Now we're talking about this anonymous world. There's, there's two of us and two walls. The obvious strategy now is for this sort of to move to this wall and for this sort of to move to that wall and just move to the right. Now we are finding that. So here's a field lab. And what I have here is the very original field lab for some pairs of locations, by the way, how many of you have seen four, five, six locations? Can I tell you this? And it's my house. So this is a lot of So then I punch in a zero, I punch this zero at all of these other locations of robots. So I got a zero of one gallon for you here, and a zero of one gallon for me here. And I allow the water to flow in here. And the question is, can I get a total of two gallons for me out of here, which then necessitates a one gallon for me here and a one gallon for me here? Now, in this case, this is possible, and I feel this here. to how the robots get moved. So the first robot gets done is moved, moved to Z, uh, moved next to X, moved next towards Y, um, and then like that. Now, how do you then see the general coordinates for these robots? Um, so let's see what happens, for example, the one robot here, I punch the zero, tries to move from U to Z, and another robot from U to Z, by hitting X here. That doesn't work because this X here allows only a flow of one gallon per minute. So if two robots want to move through there, you would have two gallons per minute, not the last. Similarly, if two robots try to move, say, into a Z here, so one robot from U attempts to zero, tries to move into Z, uh, the other one coming from X tries to move into Z, uh, but it's the inverse context. And again, that is not allowed here because this type here only allows for a flow of one gallon. Two robots want to go there, that would be a flow of two gallons per minute. So, so you can see how these things work. Um, and, and as you know, flow algorithms are extremely fast. Now, in reality, if you want to do this for Amazon, you need to, um, um, you need to do a mix between these two things. Um, and why is that the case? Um, so you have then some blue robots, some, some blue holes, some red robots, some red holes. You could assign you have to find the one-to-one -one mapping from the blue goals to the blue robots and the red goals to the red robots and then find conflict-free paths so that you minimize something like make spend or flow time. So why is that the case? And it's the case because if you have two robots available, um, he has orders for the teddy bear and uh, he has orders for the human robot, then it doesn't matter which robot you send to which one of these serving robots. The robots are completely anonymous. You can pick which robot you pick. But once the robot has picked up and taken the other one, for example, then you need to bring it to the packing station at which the package um, that I have ordered will sit in the army of some other things is being packed. You can't send the robot to a different pack packing station. That wouldn't work. So the robot now has become non-anonymous. OK, so how do you solve it? You just combine the technology. You use the flow techniques to plan for a group of robots, like the blue group of robots. You assign targets to them, find conflict-free paths to them. Um, and then you treat the blue group of robots as a meta agent and use the blue meta agent and the green meta agent as part of conflict research. That's it. So how fast does it do? Uh, so 
So here's the choosing number of agents. Uh, here is this algorithm that I just talked about. So it's very fast. And here is sort of an algorithm um, that lots of people always ask about, right? It's a lot, you know, you said earlier, just two minutes ago, when you come in and solve optimization problem, why don't you use standard solvers from combinatorics optimization like sleep tests and the and you put in the problem and solve it, right? And, and tackle the problem, and you can do it, right? But you see that, that it doesn't feel quite as sound, right? So the search algorithms really do utilize structure very well. So let me end just with, with a video, right? I mean, showing that, that the algorithms really, really work. If you execute them on robots, you need to think a little bit about this because you didn't model things like acceleration, for example. So you need to do some post-processing step that adjust the speed properly of the robots so that they don't run into each other because of these non-modeled constraints. Uh, but you can certainly do it. Um, and at this point in time, you've learned something about the single agent search, um, about single agent search and multi agent search. So I hope that these techniques that you learned here give you sort of a, a good foundation for applying them in various ways in your life. So let me stop here, and if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Okay, questions. I don't know whether I can find the slide that much because there's so, so many other slides in between. But that was basically sort of the idea, right? So the idea is first find a path, and in our case, we found a path on the grid, um, and then apply that function, right? Yeah. So that's this so one here. In this case, you, are, you actually had uh, two times both the single agents. Yeah. Yes, but if you first connect, you need only one of the single agents. Um, what would you do? Search techniques, right? Remember, there are two operators and three steps, right? So they say at any point in time, the robot can do you know, one of two things. It can either wait for its time slot or it can move the data, right? And we assume that moving the data takes too much time. So in that sense, right, I mean, the other thing is extreme, right? So when you wait and when you move, but the movement speed is sort of all the same, right? It's sort of one position for all the movement. One of the problems is that in reality, right, if you tell the robot to move, there's one data set for one robot to move the data yet, and one robot that's moving the data yet, right? So there's very few there's very few things like that. Right? So that's one thing. The other thing is that you haven't taken into account that the robot has to accelerate, right? So if the robot sits there, um, and then you want it to go to an earlier cell, that will take longer than if it was already moving at full speed. And that's the reason you can't. Right? And if you have to sit, then all of the robots can one move from 
questions for Professor Koenig, I would suggest you come up and ask him, but we will be back here at 1 p.m. Yeah, I'll, I'll be around very much. <laughs> So the, the problem as originally stated, right, where every 